Welcome to another Bible class here at Epiphany Lutheran Church. We're so glad to have you with us today. My name's, I'm Pastor Nathan, and this is Pastor John. We are a couple of pastors here at Epiphany Lutheran Church, and like I said, we're glad to have you with us as we continue through the Red Letter Challenge today. Today we're looking back at the week we just finished, the week of being, which is week two of the, the Red Letter Challenge here. Um, today we're just going to walk through some of the... Uh, the different lessons that we went through or processed during the week, really with the focus of how can we, in a world that wants to um, basically tell us lies about who we are and um, what we have been made to do and be in this world, how can we um, practice some habits, some disciplines that will keep us rooted in that and connected mm-hmm. in what our Lord has told us about ourselves and how that impacts us. Yeah, and if you heard Pastor Nathan's sermon last week, he hit the nail right on the head. It's not just the world that tries to define who we are, but we do what ourselves by what we do. Yeah. So I'm a pastor. I'm an architect. I'm a whatever you want to fill, fill in the blank. And when we stop being those things, when we retire or whatever, all of a sudden we can have an identity crisis because the truth is our identity is not tied up in what we do. It is who we are, which is the thrust of this week. Right. And so so this week really is important for us as as Americans and not just as human beings, but specifically as Americans because we do tie um, who we are to what we do so very tightly. And so it's helpful for us to step back and be like, no, I'm different than what I do. Yeah. You know, I'm more than just what I do and what I offer to, to society. Um, just we'll, we'll walk through, hopefully you've had a chance to download the guide that's available in the show notes or the description uh, right below the video. So if you haven't had a chance to download that, print that off or however, and you'd like to use that to follow along, hit the pause button and download that and print that and get it to a place where you can follow along with it and then uh, hit the play button again. So... We're just following along here in the Red Letter Challenge. This past week, we spent time going over the basics of being in God's presence and letting Him talk to us about our identity. Now, we live in a world that has many things to say about who we are and why we exist. However, we have a clear message about who we are as followers of Jesus. While on the one hand, we are broken people people who daily break the commands of God and follow our own sinful ways, we're also loved, redeemed, and forgiven children of the Most High King of the Universe. When the world obscures us, uh, those truths to us, we may find ourselves struggling with our identity as laid out in Scripture. And that was the point of the sermon and the point of the week. Um, how can we get back to that identity? So this week, uh, the Red Letter Challenge is about clearing a path and how we live for God to come and remind us of who and whose we are. And that's why we're talking about being. And, and, and it's empowering. Yeah. Because the, the truth is, that we can actually engage in activities that remind us who we are in Christ. Because a lot of times we just flounder. Yeah. And we'll ask the question, you know, who am I? Mm-hmm. Um, songwriters do it all the time. Yeah. You know, who yeah. are you? I really want to know. The who. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we struggle with this question. As kids grow up, you know, they try to identify themselves um, by their athleticism or their academic skills. All those things ultimately mm-hmm. are going to leave us wanting mm-hmm. because none of them completely tell us who we are. They tell us what we often do. Yeah. And so this is so important because we can engage in things that help us be reminded who God has made us. And that's going to, as we're going to see as the Red Letter Challenge progresses, that's going to serve as a foundation for the rest of the weeks. Um, it's going to be really hard to be comfortable, and maybe comfortable is the wrong word, but to be able to satisfactorily forgive and be forgiven if we are not living yeah. inside of this foundation of who we are in Christ. Well, and since, just so you'll know, since I have the forgiving Bible study, my point is that you can't even be without being forgiving. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they do. These all work together. You kind of yeah. have to have... Um, they're, they, they, they're all part of this tapestry of how God sees us and how we interact with the world in a way that's pleasing to him. So that's why being is important and then forgiving also is important yeah. as we prepare to serve and then give and go. Yep. They all build on one another. So this, uh, today we're going to be in Psalm 46 is where we're starting. Psalm 46 verses 
10 and 11, this is what the Lord says. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I love that, that be still. In, in a culture that um, is hustle and bustle and go, 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 and always have things to do, um, the idea of being still is something of a foreign concept, I think, for many people in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, why, is, why does being still, do you think, matter for us as we follow Jesus? Because we can only effectively do out of who we are. Yeah. And if we're not being still and allowing God to speak to us, to define us, to forgive us, to do his good work, uh, then we can be doing things for a while, but eventually we dry up. Yeah. We must, under, we must do our doing out of our being that God can only do for us. So we need to just stop and listen because the world is full of motion. Yeah. It's full of noise, mm -hmm. and we can just get caught up in it and forget who we really are, our true identity in Christ. I, this, As you were talking, I'm thinking about how um, that noise causes us to miss the promise that our God is with us, yeah. that the Lord of hosts is with us, that the God of Jacob is our fortress. If all we're doing is going, 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 and not stopping and listening and reminding ourselves, oh, yeah, um, this God who has made us and built us is still with us. And that does a couple of things for us, right? The first thing is that like there's a comfort factor of being the fortress. But there's a second side to that. If he's with me, then I have a responsibility to act a certain way because yeah. he's present. It's kind of like... Um, you know, when the teacher's present in the classroom, the kids are more likely to behave, but the teacher leaves and all of a sudden, whoa, you know, I've got, there's potential for chaos there mm -hmm. at that point. Um, when God is with us, that's that twofold sort of thing. I have a responsibility to do things that please him, but I also have the promise of his incredible presence. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't know about your parents, but my mom, hey, remember, what, as I was going out with my friends, whether it was in junior high or high school, and I was a little bit... Uh, rambunctious at times she always wanted my remember who you are yeah you know and she might also say god is watching everything <laughs> you do but she wanted me to remember god's with me it's not as if i'm just out doing my own thing but how often do we live our lives right as it's my life i can do whatever i want and i'm doing my own thing well as a follower of jesus christ that just is not true right and that goes back to the verse 10 actually of psalm 46 where he says i will be exalted among the nations yeah. That's that ambassador idea that this is who we are and whose we are and our actions and words reflect. And we talked a little bit about this last week, actually, about how Christians uh, may or may not do a great job of reflecting this God. And so we start off with the being, recognizing that, well, we're his ambassadors all the time. And mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to um, act that way, even though we know we won't always. It doesn't take away from the responsibility. Exactly. But, but it also gives us great security yeah. because it's all about what God has done for me. If I try to find my security, my identity in what I do, well, when I stop doing it, I lose that. Or if I find my security, my identity in someone else, it might be mm -hmm. my wife. Well, hopefully my wife and I will stay married till death do us part, but yeah. until death do us part. Right. And if I, if Linda finds her identity in me as John's wife, or I find my identity in Linda as Linda's husband, and Linda's gone, again, I lose my identity. Right. You know, if I find my identity in my money, and all of a sudden everything crashes, what happens? I lose my identity. So whenever we put our, or try to find our identity in anything other than the person for whom we were created to find identity, eventually yeah. it's going to be a dead end. Yep. And so we have to start this whole process with being, just being still. And like God is, our God is the one that gives us purpose, strength, identity, everything. Yeah. And because he is eternal, that purpose and identity remains eternal too, yeah. which is really cool. Well, and you've heard how sometimes parents try to live through their children. Right. And they put a lot of pressure on their children to be the best. 
Right. Well, why do they do that? Well, because they're trying to l find their identity. This is my son. This is my daughter. Look what they've accomplished yeah. as if now I get credit for it. Right. It's a reflection on me as a parent, as a dad, <laughs> or as a, a mom. And again, that is so unfair to that child yeah. because you're trying to f ask them to give you identity, which they can't do. Right. But it also puts your identity on very uh, shaky ground because they cannot live up to the expectation expectations that we put on them if we're trying to find our identity through them but jesus has words for us if we should find ourselves on that path yes and that's the really really cool what he has to say which is matthew 11 starting at verse 25 at that time jesus said i praise you father lord of heaven and earth because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children yes father for this was your good pleasure all things have been committed to me by my father no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And these wonderful words. Yeah. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I love that idea of the taking, I love the idea, the reality of the rest that we find in Jesus. It's not just the idea of the rest. There's a lot of places that give us, all, that have um, the possibility or promise of rest. Jesus' rest is actual and real. Yeah. And that is so much better than whatever the world has to offer or whatever other idol because no other person no thing no stuff can give us the kind of soul quenching rest that jesus can give us yeah because we were created to find our identity in god yeah and if we try to find it anywhere else you can just see how this is not a good plan yeah th they're going to fail you yep and so um what we're i asked the question here what kinds of things are we taking a rest from with jesus and well, we've already mentioned a lot of it. We've taken a rest from trying to, fi trying to find our identity in other places mm -hmm. and just resting in him. And I'm going to get to this in, in next week's Bible class, but how often do we become weary because we're not really willing to really give our sins over to Jesus? Oh. We're going to make atonement for him. I messed up. I am going to try harder next time. And so we start our worship service by confessing our sins, and we lay them at the foot of the cross, and then what do we do after the service? Boop, right we back. pick them back up again, and we leave. And then we wonder why we're tired. Yeah, right, as, as, we're, as we're like dragging that around with us mm -hmm. um, on a daily basis. Oh. So, yeah, we take a rest from trying to carry on and hold our sin and deal with our sin, and we take a rest from, from the idolatry of trying to find our, our identity in other people yeah. and other things. And that then leads us to the, the rest of the study here today, which is these seven points, um, seven different ways that Zach Zender points out that the church has found useful over the last 1,000, 1,500 years to reorient us when we miss the path when it comes to our identity in Jesus. So we've got some tools if we'll just take them up and use them to get us back to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and the first one is this. It's reading God's word. Um, there's a couple different passages we're going to talk about here. One is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And the other is Deuteronomy 8, 3, which is quoted rather um, a fair bit for mm -hmm. you know a single verse in the Old Testament. A lot of places do talk about it in the New Testament. But 1 Timothy Paul writes this to his son in the faith. All, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And if you go ahead and read the Deuteronomy passage, Deuteronomy 8, 3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Wow. <laughs> I, 
You know, one of the things that just struck me about that passage as you were reading it was how the Lord put them in a place where they needed the word of the Lord yeah. in order to survive. And it just got me thinking, how often you know, does the Lord put us in a place where we need his word? Total dependency. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, I mean, this, it's like we, we like to walk around thinking how, you know, very independent we are. Um, that's part of our, the fabric of our nation. And while there are many blessings to being uh, independent, the, the freedom of being able to, to worship as one chooses and for us to, to share the gospel, there's an independence that's, that's powerful. But it kind of crosses a line when we get to a place where that independence says, I don't even need God's help. Yeah. I don't need the word. I, don't, I, I can do this on my own. Thank you very much. I'm cool. Go help somebody who really needs the help. Mm-hmm. And the word of the Lord, actually, Deuteronomy 8.3 is great. It says, like, no, I'm going to put you in a place where you need me. Yeah. Um, not because our, you know, and I just, I don't think it's because our God's, um, he's not vicious or vindictive. But he knows our need better than we know our need and wants us to recognize that need before it has eternal consequences in our lives. At least that's the way scripture goes right. uh, on the whole. Well, and, and also this Deuteronomy passage, you know, Jesus quotes this when he's being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And what's the temptation? If you are the mm-hmm. son of God, if you you are who you see you are, you'd better prove it by doing mm-hmm. that stuff. And Jesus says, hold it. <laughs> yeah. I am who I am. Yes. Which is what Yahweh means. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's not by what I do. And, and the temptation there, of course, the specific temptation, unless we, I don't want to be accused of, of missing the point of the temptation. Satan was saying to Jesus, hey, Jesus, you better take care of yourself Mm -hmm. and turn this stone into bread because if uh, you don't take care of yourself, if you don't look out for number one, who will? Well, Jesus knew who it was. His father was there with him. He was always going to take care of him, even as he takes care of us. Yeah, and that ties back into what we just talked about, this identity thing. This was an attack on Jesus' identity as as a son of the, as the son, the only begotten son of the king of the universe, of the father. And that same attack still happens today. And our responsibility and our reaction is similar to it needs to be Jesus's reaction when that temptation comes. Is It is to use the word, um, to rely on the word as Jesus relied on the word at yes. that point. And I think about this. Martin Luther talks about we're supposed to relearn and inwardly digest the word of God. What does that mean and how is that going to help us when it comes to identity? I asked that question to you because, you know, it's, that's a pretty stark image that Martin Luther uses. Right. Well, the, the word needs to be in us so it can do its work through us. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, I, I am a firm believer, and I, I don't know if I'm getting off on a little tangent here, but if I am, I am. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in memorizing Scripture. Yeah. It should be so embedded in our minds that when we are confronted with a choice, and we have choices to make all the time, there's this guiding light that right. says, this is the way as a child of God you will go, and I'm going to give you the power to do it. We might be tempted to go a different way, but we have learned it, we have studied it, we have inwardly digested it. It is a part of who we are. In fact, it's creating who we are. Right. And so that, 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 when we read the Word, that is how we digest it. When we memorize the Word, it's becoming a part of us and then empowers us to live as God's people. Because if we're not in the word, then we don't know what our God says about us. Yeah. And if he, we don't know what he says about us, then we can't possibly know how to combat what Satan would, or our sinful nature or the world around us tell us about ourselves. Yeah. That is not true. Well, and you think of the temptation of Jesus. Three different temptations. Each time, Jesus says in the Greek, Grapatai, mm-hmm. it is written. Yeah. He goes back to the word of God. Jesus yeah. knew it. Yeah. And If that's how Jesus deals with Satan and temptation, how are we going to deal with Satan and temptation? It's through the Word of God. But that's the scary part, because how often do we neglect that only offensive weapon? Paul talks about, you know, the whole spiritual armor of God. There's only one offensive weapon he's describing, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the The Word word of of God. 
yep, that's why we have to make it a part of our lives and shouldn't be surprised that when we miss our scripture reading, our daily devotions, if you will, in God's word, if things go a little awry in the day and we, we maybe respond differently than we would normally yeah. um, if we've missed that. At least that's been my my experience. Well, I, and let me challenge the listeners. If indeed we live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, and we're only eating once a week, <laughs> yeah. we're going to be malnourished <laughs> yeah. at best. Yeah. Starved to death at worst. That's right. That, that's that starving our faith. Yep, that's right. So that's one way we can be in God's presence and be reminded of our identity and who we are according to what our God says, which is the truth. Um, the second thing is we've got to spend some time in prayer um, with God. There's a couple of passages. There's actually many passages that talk about this. Um, we're going to spend time in Philippians and in Matthew just briefly touching on this. Matt, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And if you keep on going to verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's not in your reading, but how often should we pray? You know, Paul says, pray without ceasing. ceasing. Yep. It's a continual um, dialogue with God. God speaking to us through his word mm -hmm. and our responding to God in prayer. Right. And if we're not doing that, um, well, have, we'll see what Jesus' Jesus's example example of prayer. But there is something that um, we could talk about, too, that kind of connects to what we did in, mm -hmm. in the first one. So if you read that for so us. So Matthew 14, 23a. After he had dismissed them. And he had just uh, fed the 5,000. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, who is in this perfect communion with the Father and the Spirit, still takes time to go by himself to pray. Yeah. I love that, that, that we have this saying, no, no, sometimes we do need to, to be alone with God, and we'll talk about that more in point four, but we do need to take that time in prayer. Um, prayer has been likened to spiritual breathing, mm -hmm. and if we're not praying very often intentionally, we're kind of holding our spiritual breath yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. we, if we don't do that. So, I mean, prayer for us in that identity is making sure that we are breathing, that we are relaxed in who we are. And that only happens when we're in communication with God yeah. on a consistent basis. Yep. We're talking with him and listening to what he says as we're doing point one, which is reading his word and listening to what he's speaking to us through the spirit. Um, what are some tools that have helped you with prayer in your own prayer life? I have, I have told this story in Bible class in the past, but what's helped me is just understanding what prayer is and how it is a dialogue. When I was in college, uh, a friend of mine and I decided, you know what, if Jesus could go up on the mountainside and pray all night long, we can surely get up in the morning and pray for an hour. So we were at Concordia College in River Forest. We got up at 6 o'clock, and for an hour, from 6 until 7 in the morning, we were going to have prayer time. And then we we're going to go have breakfast. After about five minutes, <laughs> we kind of looked at each other. What now? We, we, we prayed for what we could think of, and we were just at loggerheads. And, and we kind of, it fell out of uh, uh, being a habit for us because we just got bored and we didn't know what to say. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it, it's true. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was reading one of Luther's writings and, or a, a, a biography about Luther, and the author said Luther always prayed with his Bible open. And what he meant by that is that Luther would be studying the Word, and as God spoke to him through the Word, Luther responded, Hey, Lord, you're right. I have been so busy. Let, let's say he was reading, Be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I have been so busy, I haven't taken the time just to sit in your presence and seek your rest. Help me to do that. And so God speaks to him, the Spirit convicts him, and Luther not only confesses his sin, but he asks for 
the Lord's help. Yeah. And so there's this dialogue going on. When we learned that, um, Mike Trask was my friend, when we learned that, we could go back there, and we found that an hour uh, of prayer was not that big of a deal because we were taking time to let God speak to us, and then we would respond. And so we always incorporated uh, prayer and the Word. And that's probably been the thing that has fundamentally changed my prayer life more than any other. That was sounds very similar to something that Tim Keller talks about in his book on prayer, where he's where prayer for for us is not about us finding God, seeking Him, and trying to start a conversation with an unknowable God that is um, just kind of up there, and we have to do all the you know hold our hands the right way and yep. make sure we get the the right directional signal out to Him so He'll respond, if you will. But it is a conversation that we enter into that He starts with us. Yeah that he's the one who comes to us and through his word says, let's talk. And there's some, uh, and that's so freeing because now all of a sudden the pressure's off for us to try to come up with topics and things to talk mm-hmm. to with God about. It's a, it, it is a, as, as you said, it is this easy, sometimes not so easy, he says hard things, but it is a conversation that is easy to enter into because we know exactly where to go to start and and, and we know who's talking to us yeah it's not an unknown angry deity right it is god the father god the son god the holy spirit who have proven their love for us over and over again so they have this they initiate this conversation with us and we have this privilege of actually responding back to him opening up our hearts to the lord so that we can be honest with him just as as little children to their parents yeah which we, is which is why jesus says in the lord's prayer when you pray because the disciples say hey lord john taught his uh, disciples how to pray would you teach us how to pray sure when you pray pray like this our father right who art in heaven right. so he lets us know that this is a real person not some unknown deity not some um nebulous deity mm-hmm. but it's a personal god who wants to have a relationship with us so much so that we have the privilege of calling him father to to add to what you had said earlier um the idea of letting scripture inform our prayer life and then responding out of that one of the things that's been helpful recently for me i've been going through the psalms is to let you know have a psalm and let that psalm sort of be the conversation throughout the day because they're relatively short some of them are some of them aren't and if they're longer you kind of got to take them in chunks um but letting that psalm be sort of the conversation of the day and saying, Lord, how do you want me to see this day? And um, letting the psalm dictate kind of where my conversation with the Lord is. It's like, Lord, um, defend me against my enemies if it's more of a, an imprecatory psalm. Mm-hmm. It's like that the, the psalm of, Lord, you know, you know champion my cause. Or, or Lord, um, thank you for what you have done. You're such an incredible God. Let that, let that psalm be that conversational yeah. piece throughout the day is one way to do that that I found helpful recently. Um, and if you've been following along in the new devotions before Red Letter Challenge, I said that that was one of the things I needed because COVID-19 had thrown so many things out of whack mm-hmm. that it was that I, that I found my, well, my prayer life flagged a bit and I needed handholds yeah. to get back into prayer. And the Psalms are a great kind of handhold to get back into yeah, it. The, the Psalms are the original hymn book of the church, right. uh, of God's people. And... They're just so beautiful because they're real. Yeah. They understand our life. It's not a, pa- a, a fantasy world. It's not some type of fake utopia. It's real, gritty stuff that we live in. Yeah. And in these psalms, the prayers of God's people come forth. And so we, we meditate on them, and they speak for us. Also, and it's not on the same level as the Word of God, but I did this with the, the leadership council for the devotion. We just meditated upon, or I share with them, a hymn from one of our hymnals. Yeah. Um, and it was a God of grace and God of glory on your people, pour your, your power. power. <laughs> and um, so it, that's another way to help us pray, just to meditate. Um, you know, one of the challenges of being this week was to listen to praise music. Yep. You, you fill your mind with praises of God, and what you find before long is that you're not only filling your mind with the praises of God, the praises of God are now on your tongue, and yeah. you are praying It filters back. into the rest of your body. It's amazing what comes in here yep. starts to filter throughout the rest of us, and, and as it comes out of our mouths and, and, and changes the, the kind of the attitude of our hearts, 
if we'll just let it. Yeah. And and by by and the, two of the primary ways we can do that is by reading the word and by spending time in prayer, and then also in singing, which there's oftentimes the prayers of the church, which yeah. dictate the prayer life, which is so cool. Um, number three. So, uh, speaking of what we were just talking about here, worshiping God in both word and deed. And we're going to talk about what we mean by that in a minute. Romans 12, 1 says this, um, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We just touched on what it means to worship God with word. You know, mm-hmm. being, you know, that is the singing of his praises and the, the, the letting, letting the truth about him kind of flow through us and out of us in, 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 as we sing and as we join God's people in, in honoring him in that praise. Um, in your own words, I, I, or I guess that's not quite the way I want to say it, but, you know, one of the things that, that, that he, Zender talks about is this idea of what is worship. So what is worship as we follow Jesus Christ in this world? I, I forget his specific definition, but I define worship as bowing down mm-hmm. in love because it's not a compulsion that God's forcing us to our knees in front of him, you know, as if as he is some angry God, but it is falling down and adoring yeah. this God who has made me, who has redeemed me when I went astray, who has called me to be his own by the power of the Holy Spirit and has given me in addition to himself every other <laughs> blessing, grace upon grace, and so for me, worship is coming into the presence of God, ascribing to him, that was the mm-hmm. word you used yesterday in, in the devotion, ascribing to him um, how awesome he is, just taking time to ponder the magnificence, the beauty, the goodness, yeah. the graciousness of God. That is certainly part of the worship, but it's also, as we've talked about in the past, um, we call worship the divine service. Yeah. It's also receiving yeah from God, what only God can give me, like my identity through the forgiveness of sins in the person of Jesus Christ. Right. It is, um, it is this thing where we, are, um, where, we are, where we are in worship, we receive and we give. Um, there is, like, for, in my mind, there's two kinds of worship. There's the, there's the worship where we gather corporately, mm-hmm. right, where we receive God's good gifts. We ascribe or and ascribe. I had to look it up. Ascribe just means to... Um, it, and kind of in brief to connect a thing to a thing. Like God's got honor and power here. He's got honor. He's got all glory, honor, and power. Here's why. And so we connect those two things together. Um, when we ascribe that to him in worship, what we're doing is saying, God, you've done all these things in our lives, and we know it's you because you are powerful. You are incredible. You are the one who is working in this world for the benefit of your people. As Paul will write, works all, good, all things for the good of those who love him. We know this, and so this is part of our, like, worship, that we're connecting those things together um, corporately as God's people. Um, but there's also individual worship. Yeah. And so we've got to have both. And um, you, you, you kind of ha- can't do the individual well if you don't have the corporate. And you can't do the corporate well if you don't have the individual either. If you lean too heavily on either one... Um, Things get out of balance for God's people Mm -hmm. uh, rather badly. And that's part of why the struggle with COVID-19 has been so real for God's people because we've missed for so long the ability to um, worship in a way that, 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 the kind of unbounded, unhindered, if you will, because even as we're coming back to worship as God's people at Epiphany and we're ramping up services and, and preparing the sanctuary and we're in the AFLC here, as we're doing that, um, we still got these mask things that we're mm-hmm. wearing and we're still socially distancing. There's not that level of, man, I, I don't know, that, pers- that personableness, that personal mm-hmm. nature of connecting with God's people together that we're still missing. Yeah. Um, but that's part of what, why, we, why we miss it is corporate worship matters yeah. as much as individual worship matters. Individual worship, however, is a little bit different ballgame mm-hmm. than corporate worship, right? Individual worship is more, all right, how am I 
living a life that ascribes worthiness to God and yep. who he is and as an ambassador for him. And that's Romans 12, mm -hmm. this living a life as a holy sacrifice um, to God. That's our spiritual, quote unquote, spiritual worship. worship yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do we live? So how do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think, again, it's understanding who we are in Christ and what God has done for us. I worship my God when I love my wife. Yeah, yeah. I worship God when I care for someone in need because I realize that all these things, people, stuff, it's all God's, yeah. and he has brought it into my life either to help them experience God's love more fully through me or for me to experience God's love more fully through them. Right. And so it, worship should never be uh, reduced to simply that time that we're sitting in church on a Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, whenever yeah. you go to worship. But it is, uh, that's corporate worship mm -hmm. with other people. But we worship outside the walls of the church all the time. That's that, that's that as you're saying, that adoration that says, um, when people look at us, they see someone else because we're we're wholly focused on being like and reflecting Him into the world and what we say and do. That that sort of worship. So we need both because that corporate worship fills us up, as does being in the Word and as does being in prayer, to then be able to go and reflect Him into the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and I think we we also need to understand uh, that. Some people will say, well, I, I can worship God out in the woods. I, I don't go to church because I, I, I experience God through nature. Or as one of our members who's now sainted and with the Lord, he's used to convince, try to convince himself, I could worship God on the golf course on Sunday morning just as easily as I could uh, in, in the pews. And the question is, oh, really? <laughs> so when was the last time you received the body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins on the golf course? <laughs> right, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> Brother or sister in the pew is missing something that you can provide. That's right. Your support and encouragement in that space. You're part of the body of Christ. <laughs> right, and so the, you know if, we've, if we're if we're not doing our part, it's missed. Yep. Which is a big deal. Yeah. Um, so we talked about how we do this in both word and deed. We worship God and his, we sing his praises, but we also do uh, in the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of how we worship as that spiritual sacrifice. However, there are times, and that's point number four, where we need to take time to be alone with God. Um, there, there, are, there is a space for being um, for solitude. Oh, in our, yeah, there's a, there's a huge space there for solitude. Would you read Mark 1, 35? Very yes. early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So the Son of God, who came to seek and to save the lost, who came to um, disciple his followers, to be with people, lived on this earth for 33 years as one of us, takes time to be by himself. I think that's so powerful that we need to just step back for a second and say, well, what do we mean by spending time alone with God? Because um, solitude is not, solitude is not us on Netflix. Yeah, by ourselves. <laughs> yeah, by ourselves. But I was out on the porch by myself with Netflix. You know, but I was trying to tell my wife the other day, because I wanted to watch the football game, that I needed some solitude. And so it's just going to be in the room by myself watching the game. <laughs> no, nah, it doesn't You're work right. like that. No, it's not. It, it is. It, solitude is not us, um, us spending time by ourselves uh, being entertained, you know, alone, if you will. Although there is value and benefit for that losing ourselves. There is an occasional time where we just mm -hmm. need to step mm -hmm. back from the world for a bit in that. Um, solitude is not also an excuse to avoid people. Right. And I think sometimes that, um, I think sometimes we use solitude and use, um, man, I just need some me time as an excuse to not love people. Yeah. Um, and so we don't mean solitude in those ways. We don't mean solitude as getting away for entertainment and solitude as a means of escaping other folks. Right. This kind of solitude has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And that purpose is to t spend time alone with God. God. <sighs> so that we'll be better engaged, uh, 
prepared to re-engage in a life of service to others. Yeah. Th that was the problem that Martin Luther had with the monastic life. Yeah. It was, he saw it as a retreat often from the world in which we are called to serve. Right. And so we're cloistered away from the world so we won't become contaminated by the world. And originally, th there was actually some really good ideas behind the, 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 the thought of monasticism, but the danger or what happened as yeah. it evolved is that it became this, I am more spiritual than you are. I am separating myself from you so I don't get dirty. Well, how can you help someone get clean right. if you're afraid to get dirty? How can you uh, right. be there to serve someone if you separate yourself from them? Right. And so we like solitude taken to that, ex to that level keeps us from doing the other four weeks that we're going to yeah. be challenged to, to do in the forgiving, the serving, the giving, and the going. Uh, but what we do need to do is we, sometimes we need to take time away to spend time with God. And we know how we do that. And that's those first three ones. We take solitude. The point of taking time alone with God is to enhance points one, two, and three. Yeah. Is to enhance our worship, to enhance our, our prayer life, and to enhance our time in God's word. Uh, one of my uh, favorite authors of a few years ago was... Uh, professor, author, Eugene Peterson. Mm -hmm. and, and he was really big into the spiritual disciplines. And when I was reading about his life, he and his wife, they lived, uh, when he died, I believe he was up near Vancouver, Washington, or something like that, British Columbia. But it was very, lots of trees in the wilderness. And so on Monday mornings, he and his wife would get up early and they would walk in the woods all day long wow. eight to ten hours of hiking and they wouldn't say a word to one another mm -hmm. because together they were having solitude with god and they were just taking in the beauty of nature what is god speaking to them through his creation but they're also uh, meditating and memorizing scripture so god's speaking through his word but they did that and i don't know how many years it was but it was a part of their life that Monday morning, whether it was raining or snowing, um, they were out <laughs> wow. in the woods for hours and hours to have that alone time with the Lord. Yep. Isn't that cool? That's crazy. I would, you know, I just think that that's just what a devotion to that alone time. And yet we can, we can barely pull away for five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we hear that, oh, that's not even possible. I'd love to do that. But that's not possible. It is oh, possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that we choose not to go that path because we feel we have to do other stuff that's more important. Right. We've chosen to fill our lives with something else. Yep. Yep. So those are the first four points. Point number five is this. It's fasting. That's one of the ways that we, um, we can step away from maybe perhaps what we believe we are and just be in God's presence. That's Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Jesus says these words, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Um, Jesus doesn't command fasting in Scripture. He does anticipate that his followers will fast, though, in yeah. several places in mm -hmm. Scripture, uh, particularly when the bridegroom leaves. That's right. Um, he says that that's when his followers will fast. So there is anticipation of fasting, but he doesn't command it. Um, what is the, like, as you understand it, what is the purpose of fasting in Scripture? I mean, there's a lot of purposes right. of fasting. Yeah, but, I mean, but, but for spiritual, it's a, as a spiritual discipline, it is denying yourself something mm -hmm. in order to spend whatever time you would be doing in doing that something in prayer, in study of the word, yep. communing with God. So it might be giving up a meal in order to focus on God's provision for us and right. realizing that man does not live by... Uh, bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So it's, it's a time of meditation. It might be a fasting from, as we talked about in staff meeting, social media. Yeah. You know, how often does that little phone and all those apps monopolize our time? Yes. And so it's intentionally saying, you know what, instead of going there, I'm going to put that down. Mm -hmm. I might think I can't survive without this. But I'm going to put it down for a time so that I can go where true life and so the source of life is found, and that is to God in the word and prayer. 
I, I love how I, I love how 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 the word uses this as a way of focusing our attention and our need of our need back to God. It says, "No, I I need your help." That's the that's the exclamation point at the end of the "I need you." If as John Piper will put it, it's this idea of of fasting something saying i don't need this i need god even though this thing tells me i need it desperately yeah. all the time um especially the phone but food can do that too i don't know how many folks at our culture um how many folks get home and what's the first thing they do they pour themselves a glass of wine or something to try mm-hmm. to re- unwind from the day and how has that become a crutch instead of the word and yeah. prayer being that place that allows us to unwind and, and not just unwind, but be rejuvenated yeah. as who we are and as God's people. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that glass of wine or yeah. that cell phone yep. unless you start relying on them for a little bit of security and peace because they can't deliver the goods. Nope, they sure, sure can't. Um, I do want to point out two, want to point out two things about fasting just briefly. One is it's incredible how our world, and then how it's in, it's incredible how our world uh, twists fasting. We notice how fasting is not about us; it is about focusing our need yeah. on God. And how often the, the majority of the ways we hear about fasting in our culture is all about us. It's about making us feel better, making us look better, making us you know lose weight, helping us to have more energy. Fasting, our our culture has shifted completely 180 and says, no, 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 it's about you. <laughs> Even yeah. though this is spiritual discipline, ultimately, um, is, is ultimately about God, and our world has just twisted it. And the second thing is Jesus' is point in here, how the Pharisees had turned it around on its yeah. head to make it about them. Look at me. Yeah, like as, as if it was, as if it was, and Jesus will talk about this in, in Luke's gospel, too, in one of the, the, the examples he gives, how we make it about us, either us um, meriting god's attention you know i'm i'm more righteous than that person i fast and i give that's that's what gives me the right to be in your presence god and the second thing then is oh look at me i'm just such a great person uh, to the people around us and none of those reasons are valid reasons for fasting at least from a spiritual sense yeah well and 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 the image i think at least it works for me is if i've been fasting for a while after that fast Mm -hmm. i'm hungry yeah I want to be fed. Yeah. And what's the whole point of fasting for as a spiritual discipline? I want real food. I want real life. I want Jesus yeah. himself to feed me with himself so that I can have that life abundantly that will last forever. Yeah. I want to be hungry for God. Yeah. I do want to clarify, there are valid reasons, non-spiritual reasons to fast. Sure. But let's not conflate the two. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's not point. what Jesus is talking about right. here. Right, exactly. Um, we'll just briefly touch on these last two points, point six and point seven. Uh, point six, this is Luke chapter one, verses 57 through 66. Um, it, there are many places in Scripture that talk about this. We're talking about celebrating with others what God has done and given to us out of his incredible kindness. This is one example of this. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. As God's people, one of the things that we don't do enough of is celebrating (laughs) the lord's goodness in our lives we get so caught up in what we don't have that we miss what he has done for us and then we forget to thank him for it and and also who else was celebrating with them they were celebrating not because they had had a child but because elizabeth and zachariah they were joining in their joy yeah Uh, i i love how uh zach zender Push the challenge, just throw a party. Yep. Think about everything God has done for you and invite a few people 
to celebrate with you. Yeah. And he's not, and we're, he's just saying, you know, not for a big occasion, though those are important. He's just saying life. Yeah. You know, those, the small things and the big things, um, celebrate those together um, with God's people because it's good for them to know, too, because this then begins to lay the foundation for this first, this uh, Luke chapter 1 lays the foundation eventually for John's ministry yep. and Jesus' ministry because they're like, you know, whoa. What's this child going to be if this is what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> so that celebration lays foundations later on for other folks to further be like, oh, yeah, this happened. And they celebrated. I'm going to celebrate, too, beyond that as well. So yeah. Celebration matters. We've got to celebrate. And, and, and how often do we do just the opposite, though? If something good happens to someone else, we don't celebrate and join in their joy. We think, well, they don't deserve that. I should have done, gotten that, or whatever the case might be. And we not only miss out the party of being able to celebrate with someone else, we actually become more bitter. Yep. We were created to celebrate life in the presence of a God who gives it to us abundantly. Yep, yep. And that's, um, and if we, you know, I thought, think about Andy, Andy uh, Stanley's The Enemies of the Heart, and that's that envy that says, I deserve that thing that they yeah. got. Instead of, and the opposite of that is that celebration that says, we thank you, Lord, for giving them that incredible gift. And especially because we know how incredible it is because we've wanted it. That's right. And that's where the, the, where, where, we can, where the word can turn that around in our hearts and allow us to be able to more fully celebrate with the people around us. Finally is this. Um, there's, there, there is a level beyond alone time <laughs> with God. That can happen in the course of a day. The final one is take a personal Sabbath. And this comes out of Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I love this. And, well, we'll talk about it. The, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in his creation. God takes a break. He takes a break to enjoy creation. Yep. Everything that he's done, just he celebrates it. You know what? I, and I don't know when I, I realized this. It was when I was a pastor. So, so it's been, um, I was an adult. And I'd read this section many times, and it just never clicked. And that's the neat thing about God's word. All of a sudden, you learn things that you never, wow, I never thought of that before. The first full day of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. on this earth, was the Sabbath. Yep. He creates everything, and the first thing he tells Adam and Eve to do then is, hey, enjoy it. <laughs> Take the day and enjoy my beauty, my creation, enjoy me. Take that time just to be yeah. mine and enjoy what I give you. Yep. And how often do we have excuses? Let's just put excuse after excuse after excuse. I can't do that. I can't. I don't have the time yeah. for that. And yet, we, what we will find is that if we will work our darndest to set aside a day to just enjoy and be in his creation, um, what a place of power and strength. Because our Lord knows we need it. Yeah. I mean, throughout history, throughout history, nations have tried to um, put, kind of rebel against that seven-day rhythm. Mm-hmm. And none of them have succeeded. No. <laughs> in the short term, maybe, but in the long term, they all, it, it always falls back onto this rhythm. At least in the West it has because it reflects how our God built us. There's something about that God inbuilt in us that was incredible. Yeah. That always sort of kind of rubber bands back to this location where it's like, nope, seven days, and we need at least a day to just be. Yeah. To revolve around the one who's made it all. Yes, in which then some of, if not all of the rest of these then take place. Because on the Sabbath, you know, the, the first commandment, not the first commandment, hold on, uh, one, two, third commandment. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> this, I thought just, you were this good. is a here, hold on here, <laughs> third commandment. You know, in, in the explanation of this, it's, you know, honoring the Sabbath day means we need to be in the word as part of that, yeah. so. Anyhow, we uh, hopefully this was helpful for you, a, help, a helpful um, uh, ending to or synopsis of week one. Next time around, we are talking about forgiving. Prepare to be offended. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, until next time, have a great week, day in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll talk again soon.